Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to worship again at West Avon. Since we did not have a snowstorm this morning, we were able to resume worship here in the sanctuary safely. Um, But wherever you are, I hope that you're able to spend this time thinking about the week that is coming before us, the way that God has been with you in your journey so far, and what God asks of you as we go forward from here. There are uh, a lot of different activities that are taking place. It's always better to look at the weekly update or the newsletter uh, to find out more about all of these things and many more that I don't have time to mention. Uh, But I want to highlight a few things just to make sure they're on your radar. Uh, One of them is that uh, our youth group, our 7th through 12th graders, are going to be invited to go ahead and join Mary over at Barnes & Noble uh, today. That's a change of plans from having an outdoor fire in the midst of the snow fields. Um, So hopefully everybody heard about that and can join in. That was very popular last time as a a way to be together and be warm and to visit and have some fun. Uh, In addition, there are some other activities that are taking place. Uh, One of them is that uh, this week is uh, uh, Tuesday evening is our continuing Bible study at 7 o'clock on Zoom. We'll be resuming our study of the Gospel of Mark, which is the same gospel we're hearing in worship uh, right now. Uh, So a way to go deeper into these places, and we're going to move through the whole gospel uh, also on Thursday is our, excuse me, our, our community bereavement or grief group. So if you or someone you know could benefit from that, I'm happy to fill in the details. Uh, and we're always uh, happy to have others join in who might benefit from that time. There are a few other things that are taking place. One of them that was sent out to you in those, in those weekly updates is information we just received about one of the programs offered at Webster Library, which is uh, a wonderful resource right next to uh, the West, the West Hartford Congregational Church, and that is that they're going to have an online program with John Dominic Crossan, uh, a prolific author who's had a, a very large impact. Uh, our book group here at the church has read some of his works. Um, so there's two evenings where he's going to be speaking, and um, the, we, again, much more information to be up on that, but if you look at your weekly update, you'll find out more, and this is open to anyone who wants to take part, so uh, we want to make sure that you're aware of that opportunity if that would be of interest. This is uh, the last Sunday before Lent, and so coming up on Tuesday would have been Shrove Tuesday, now it's going to be snow probably, um, and then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And there, I've been a part of so many discussions with other pastors and other churches about uh, what practices will be observed. And in general, the advice right now is the same as for our worship in that uh, the things we can do to not congregate, to not come together, and to not have that personal contact uh, are the things that we can do to slow down COVID as we've been doing, to keep it slowed down so that we can resume things that we want to enjoy together. Uh, In keeping with that idea and that understanding, we're not going to have a special service uh, on Wednesday. We won't have uh, a time to come by just to to receive ashes, Um, and this uh, was in the information we sent out as well. Uh, Instead, I I shared in in that information in the weekly update some ideas for how this can be practiced in your own home, Um, and that can take a lot of different shapes, so take a look at that and see. Uh, there is also an invitation that if it is deeply meaningful for you and, and you feel that you really need it to be me who imposes ashes upon you, if you will reach out to me and we will make arrangements to do that as safely as possible individually, um, I'm, I'm happy to try to do that. So I know it's a strange year, uh, but we just want to go ahead and do everything we can uh, to make it so that we can move past this and be able to be together safely. And we're going to keep doing that in every way we can and keep monitoring the situation. A few other announcements to go ahead and lift up. One of them is that uh, we did put out word if there are folks who are interested in exploring membership here in the church. uh, It's been a while since we've given that opportunity because of not being together the way we want to. Uh, But there are ways we could go ahead and do this. So uh, I've already heard back a little bit. If there are others who want to know more about this or who are interested in the idea of becoming members, uh, please do contact me. I'd be happy to to discuss that more with you. Also, one other big announcement, and that's uh, coming up uh, on February February 21st. It's a special opportunity. So um, uh, from our Board of Outreach and Board of Deacons, again, this announcement, our church services may be virtual, but the need to support gifts of love with food for their clients remains. On the third Sunday of February, the Board of Outreach and Deacons will once again be collecting food around Farmington, Avon, and Simsbury for any families who wish to donate. It's very simple to make a donation. You simply send an email to wacc.outreach at gmail.com. 
with your name, your address, your email, should have that from the email, and the location where you're going to leave the food, like a back porch or garage, etc. And then on Sunday, February 21st, you get the food out by 1 o'clock, and a member of the outreach or deacon board is going to swing by and pick it up uh, between 1 and 3 o'clock. Um, back in December, they had 14 households who contributed and, and gave 25 bags of food to Gifts of Love, and they'd really love to top that with this effort. Uh, when you send the email, you're going to hear back with a confirmation that it was received, uh, and, and then uh, you're going you're to um, also receive a reminder email to go ahead and leave the food out. Uh, so the, the urging is to go ahead and consider gifts of love on your next trip to the grocery store or food delivery and add some additional non-perishable items to donate. And while anything will do, popular items are peanut butter, jelly, canned fruit, macaroni, cheese, pasta, pasta sauce, canned vegetables, cereal, canned tuna, soup, toothpaste, and toilet paper. Uh, so again, this is in the written announcements as well, but it's a great opportunity and it's a way we can give uh, and make a difference during this time, and we know there's a lot of need. Um, so if this is something you can do, please do respond. Let them know they want to make sure they plan out what, where they're going and, and know how many people they need in advance. Uh, so it's better if you don't wait to the last minute, even though that is what we love to do here at West Avon. Um, so I would encourage you to think if that's something that would be a meaningful part of Lent for you on that very first Sunday of Lent. So those are my announcements. I know there's probably a lot of other things happening as well. Again, if you go and, and delve into what we're sending you, uh, you will find out more detail on all of these. But as we begin our worship, we want to go ahead and take an opportunity to pass the peace with whomever you have there or online. You can share that greeting with others who are there, but we've got high fives and we've got waves and waves and all sorts of ways to go ahead and greet one another. And uh, if you're there and you're living together, you can even hug, you can shake hands, you can kiss, you can do whatever you want. We're not watching. So, um, uh, but we, we welcome you to this time of worship. What I'd like to do now is to share with you first something to, to center our thoughts, and it's a meditation by Rebecca Rupp, and she says, keep all your promises, don't take what doesn't belong to you, and always look after those less fortunate than yourself, and you'll do well in the world. Sometimes I think it's helpful to just cut through everything and remember what it takes to be a good person and a person of integrity. So a reminder. Let's take a moment to be in prayer together. Well, God, as we come together today, we ask that you would bless us and that you would bind us together as your family. On this day of transfiguration, we're reminded, we're reminded of your love for Jesus. We're reminded that he was different. He was special, and he has brought to our lives a change a change that we need, a change that has helped us to be freed from so many chains that have held us back and allowed us to hope and to dream and to believe in a future unbounded. We know, God, that all of this is possible because of you. So we give thanks, we worship you, we give praise, we lift up our lives as offerings, asking that you would help us to have wisdom and strength to move forward from here, sharing the blessings that have been given to us and making a difference in the lives of others and in this world around us. We pray all of this as we worship today, even as we now share the prayer our Savior taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we will enjoy our first hymn, Steal Away to Jesus.
He calls me by the thunder, the trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal Thank you very much, gentlemen. Happy Valentine's Day! I know that's the first thing on everyone's mind. Well, certainly more than, I imagine, Transfiguration Sunday, but that's okay. Also, two days after my birthday. Yay! So Valentine's Day is a supremely over-commercialized Hallmark holiday. Mostly. It's always been a bit of a sore spot for me, coming, again, just two days after my birthday. Oftentimes, the two celebrations got lumped together, you know, only with high school and college boyfriends. I assure you, Kevin definitely knows to celebrate each day separately. However, for other people whose birthday doesn't coincide, it's a great holiday. I think choosing a random day in the dead of winter to bring some warmth and love and chocolate is just fabulous. And really, the best part of Valentine's Day is not that you just tell love or say love, but that you get to find a way to show love. The exchange of cards for Valentine's Day began debatably long ago, but in the US, it really seemed to pick up steam in the mid 1800s as the Postal Service accessibility came into play. In the early 1900s, people even sent these things called vinegar valentines, which were cards you sent to people who you wanted to make sure knew that you weren't interested. <laughs> Ouch. It's a wonder, or it's no wonder, that Hallmark does not have a section for Vinegar Valentines anymore. But the section for Choice of Valentines cards is absolutely astounding. But back to the point. Valentine's Day is great because it's a time when we get to show our love rather than just say it. One of my favorite sayings is, actions speak louder than words. And I find so much truth in this. It doesn't mean, or it means that you don't have to spend $500 on a Tiffany's necklace to really love someone, and you don't have to buy them a PS5 to prove your devotion. I repeat, you don't have to buy them a PS5 to show your devotion. It means that the actions that come naturally within a relationship, romantic or platonic, are the best ones to solidify your love. Washing the dishes or letting someone pick their show to watch together, getting the COVID vaccine when you're able to, or just taking out the trash. These are free 
foolproof ways to prove your affection to your loved ones. Jesus was also able to show his friends, through a big action, his and God's love for them. In today's readings, we hear about transfiguration, where Jesus briefly illuminates in front of his friends, and God speaks to them, telling them to listen to Jesus. I want to say this message is somewhere in between a vinegar valentine and a hallmark valentine. Still, a reminder to listen to Jesus is never a bad thing. Listening to what he has to say about love could give us all a lot of useful guidance during our Valentine's celebrations. I'll leave you today with this reminder of love for Valentine's celebrations. Whether you're celebrating romantic love, familial love, love of friends, love of pets, or love of Jesus. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Amen. For today's reading, we go to the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's, it's good that we're here. Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And they, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to not tell anyone what they had just seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, wondering, what's this rising from the dead? Here on today's reading. Now we'll enjoy our second hymn, Into My Heart.
Valentine's Day. Well, I was going to begin my sermon by giving out the fair warning reminder that it is Valentine's Day in case there was anyone who had not yet taken the necessary steps uh, to go ahead and to show appreciation for someone else in their life or others in their lives. Um, Mary took care of that, so you've all been warned, uh, and right now you may be multitasking with one screen here and another screen frantically looking for whatever it is uh, that will fit the description. However, when she talked about vinegar valentines, that was something new for me. That was uh, new knowledge. I didn't have those. I am old now, but like I didn't have those cards that I know of available to me that I saw. Um, but I, I can recall sometimes valentines that fe felt like vinegar. Um, one happened in junior high school where there was a fundraiser where you could buy valentines and have them delivered to other people there in your school. And uh, so I think I bought five Valentines, and I, I put a, a, a single word on each one. Will you be my Valentine with the obligatory yes or no kind of checkbox thing on the end and had that delivered to uh, someone who I, I very much uh, liked and I saw as they were delivered because we were in class together. And then as she went ahead and wrote uh, on it and marked on it, and then it was handed to me from someone else probably with the check mark no. Um, so I don't know vinegar valentines in terms of kind of going that direction, but I know the other way of kind of receiving a vinegar on, on valentines, putting people on the spot, not that great, all sorts of different kinds of parts of Valentine's Day that can be awkward or difficult. Um, those are all part of this holiday as well. Uh, it is Valentine's Day, and at its core, its naming anyway, it's something that comes from a celebration of Valentinus of Rome, and we now call him St. Valentine. Uh, Lori Wagner recounts some of the details of St. Valentine, that he was a physician, and he was a member of the clergy during the time of the Roman Empire. We know him as the patron saint of love and marriage. Uh, he was best known for his ministry to persecuted Christians, allowing them to marry in secret after the Emperor, Emperor Claudius banned marriages during wartime to encourage men to battle instead. But Valentine was also known as a healer and a comforter to the sick, those ill from plague, fainting, epilepsy, and other disorders. In the end, he was killed. He was uh, martyred in a very graphic way. And all of that happened on February 14th. Now that was back in the year 270, and he was 44 years old at the time. Uh, but that date, February 14th, the date of his martyrdom, is the date that kind of got locked in here in history. I have always enjoyed some of the things that people post or put out there and kind of having fun with these different holidays. And one of the ones I really loved, uh, well, actually a few, kind of picked up the theme of thinking about the oddity of this holiday and the particular date that we have picked to celebrate it. Um, so those things will often kind of point out the irony in a way that on the anniversary of his violent martyrdom, we remember St. Valentine by sending each other chocolates and cards and flowers or having romantic meals, if you can manage that in COVID, and uh, the, the disjunction between those two things, even though he was offering marriage to those who were being denied it otherwise, obviously helping those in love with one another, still there is that kind of, that kind of roughness of placing those two things together. So usually we just kind of forget about the stuff that makes it awkward. There are many stories about St. Valentine. One of them in particular had to do with the healing of an aristocrat's daughter. He was in custody after his arrest, St. Valentine was, and Father Valentinus told his jailer, Asterius, how Christ leads pagans out of the shadow of darkness and into the light of truth and salvation. So Asterius told him if he could heal his foster daughter from blindness, he would convert. And Father Valentinus covered the girl's eyes with his hands and said, Lord Jesus Christ, enlighten your handmaid because you are God the true light. And at that, the child regained her sight. Asterius and his family were baptized according to their agreement, but you know there had to be a but coming. As strange as this holiday is and our connections to it, 
But when the emperor heard the news of this family converting, he ordered all of them executed. Yeah. Sometimes you just like to have a happy ending. You'd like things to be simple. You'd like it uh, just to all be filled with good news. But the truth is, love in its many different forms almost always is a double-edged sword. There are wonderful, amazing parts to it, and there are often costs and difficulties and rough places and struggles that are part of it as well. Now, everybody who has been in different relationships that they would describe as love know that that's part of what's involved. And we depict it so much in our society so that, for instance, most people are familiar with the basic story of Romeo and Juliet and know the perils of being in love with the wrong person and social acceptance and the difficulties that can play. Or people know how risky it is to be vulnerable to another human being, to let somebody in and to take an emotional risk that will change you. And there will also be expectations of something from you as well. Sometimes love can feel like it is incredibly complicated and difficult. But there are other times when love seems like it is simple, unfettered, amazing. It'll feel like it's always going to be perfect and easy. When folks are in that part of being in love, they walk around almost floating on air. And sometimes we refer to it as having their head in the clouds. Most people, over wisdom and over life, realize that that doesn't last forever and that after that comes the real task of working at love and being loving and accepting love, which is sometimes harder than even working to love others. Well, today, as part of this love story that's the good news found in the gospel, in this part of Mark, we hear the story of transfiguration, and it is literally an up-in-the-clouds story. We have this account that Peter, James, and John are invited by Jesus to come away with him. And we already know from early on in his ministry, this is something that he seeks to do. He seeks to take care of himself so that he can take care of others. So the four of them go off and they go to a high place. And when they're there, it's likely this is the the highest place that's visited in all the gospel accounts that we are given. We hear that something amazing happens that Peter, James, and John, they witness Jesus and we're told that his clothes are transformed so brightly white that it's far more than any bleach, any washing could ever achieve. It, it shines to them. And even more, they see Elijah and Moses there talking with him, two of Israel's greatest prophets of the past. They're speaking with him and they know in their hearts who this is. A lot of times when we visit this moment in the transfiguration We pause and we think about how we often crave those moments that will make it clear as day that Jesus was not just another one of us, that there was something incredibly special about him, that he was different even as he knew what it was like to be human. And so we get to this moment and we hear about this radiating light and we hear about these others there with him and we think, aha, here is one of those moments. Here is a time where we get that proof that we need to be able to believe something that can be difficult at times. I will tell you, though, that even if you don't go to that place when you picture what's happening, it doesn't mean that it's not spectacular in and of itself. Frederick Buchner, a a person who has written as a mystic and a spiritualist, in his book Theological ABCs, uh, uh, Whistling in the Dark, he mused on the transfiguration. He said, in the transfiguration, It was the holiness of Jesus shining through his humanness, his face so afire with it that they were almost blinded. Even with us, something like that happens once in a while. The face of a man walking his child in the park, of a woman picking peas in the garden, of sometimes even the unlikeliest person listening to a concert, say, or standing barefoot in the sand watching the waves roll in, or just having a beer at a Saturday baseball game in July. Every once and so often, something so touching, so incandescent, so alive, transfigures the human face 
that it's almost beyond bearing. Me, I think that's a helpful reminder when we are in this place of trying to decide what is this happening? How is it happening? How is it possible? Can this be something that could have happened? And our rational mind wants to flip around and, and understand every angle of it. I think sometimes it's good just to pause and, and picture what it felt like and to understand that we have moments in our life where we have seen or felt that very same thing and we know it's special. Well, Peter obviously thinks it's special. He says, let's build some shrines here. And then from a cloud, literally, again, head in the clouds, we hear God's voice, just the same as at Jesus' baptism, saying, this is my son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Jesus doesn't, in Mark, respond to Peter, doesn't you know, tell him anything about this desire to build shrines and kind of put down roots here on this mountaintop. Instead, we're told that on the way down the mountain, after hearing God's voice, Jesus begins to talk to them about the fact that he is going to rise from the dead. That mountaintop moment, that time up there in the clouds, it's amazing, and it's absolutely No wonder at all why Peter would like to stay there. I think most of us can relate to that idea that, if possible, we'd like to freeze time in that moment so it doesn't get complicated, it doesn't get difficult. It can be really tempting to say, let's just not go any further because I know, I know, this could get messed up. This could get very hard when it comes to any of our relationships and the way we try to love one another. By an interesting coincidence, this week, there's a few different dates of significance SALT Project helps to bring out with its almanac. One of them is that February 18th this week is also the birthday of Greek writer Nico Kazantzakis. And it's been a while, so you may have forgotten the name, but at the time, you heard it loud and clear. He wrote the book, The Last Temptation of Christ, and it became a scandalous book, banned by the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches, because it portrayed Jesus as being tempted to cast off his divinity so that he could lead just an ordinary human life and leave behind everything that was coming in his path. The author said he wrote it because he wanted to show the deep love of Jesus and what he overcame to do what he did. But interjecting this fiction, these pieces that aren't expressly there in the gospel and humanizing Jesus in this way was seen as so difficult. Me, when I hear and picture this moment in Jesus' ministry, among others, I wonder, since he is flesh, he is human, I wonder if Jesus felt the moment of temptation as Peter suggested, let's just stay here as Jesus heard God's voice and was surrounded there by two pillars of the faith, and he was apart from the crowds that would not let him rest. He was away from the authorities who saw him as a threat almost immediately and began plotting to get rid of him. He was away from everyone's different perceptions of who they think he should be and what they think he should do. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh, It wouldn't surprise me for even a second if he wasn't tempted to go ahead and say to Peter, yes, let's stay here. Especially because we hear on the way down that mountain, his thoughts are very much on what he knows is going to take place, what he knows is the inevitable reaction to this kingdom that he is trying to bring to people. He tells them about the things that are to come, and that is a weight that is on his heart as he moves forward. It could have been really tempting to stay there, but he doesn't. After this story, they come down the mountain right into a squabble between other disciples and legal experts. The disciples are unable to heal a boy, and Jesus does heal the boy, and then he says, you faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? You almost hear the frustration coming from this moment, this pure moment, head in the clouds, love and joy and connection and peace, and then getting back into the messiness of trying to love imperfect people in difficult times. You can almost hear how hard that is. As we study the Gospel of Mark on these Tuesday evening Bible studies, when we get to this place, and we skipped ahead quite a bit to hear the transfiguration, and we're going to snap back next week in our journey through Lent. 
When we get to this place, what we find is that we are actually in the exact middle of the Gospel of Mark. It's not very long. But we have eight chapters that are leading up to this in broad strokes, and they're describing Jesus' ministry of healing and liberation. Then there is this mountaintop experience, and when he makes his way down, the last eight chapters of the Gospel of Mark describe his descent into his passion and his death. Now it ends with the empty tomb. So I don't want to make this sound like it's all darkness, but this is a moment where the pendulum is swinging and the really hard job of loving in the face of enormous obstacles and grief and frustration are completely taking hold. But Jesus is still doing it. He is still loving in the face of all of that because he has learned to love, not just when it's easy and not just when our heads are in the clouds. That's a lesson that we could do with learning, too. Mary was very good to describe that Valentine's Day, which we think about romantic love, and that can make it difficult for folks with different experiences. Well, love can take a lot of different forms, and she pointed that out. When we looked at the Theologian's Almanac this week, another anniversary, a date that came up, I thought was a wonderful expression about love, but not only love, Love in the face of great difficulty and still loving anyway. The Almanac points out that February 17th is the day the International Committee of the Red Cross was founded in Geneva, Switzerland in 1863. Four years earlier, Swiss national Henri Dunant, while traveling on a business trip in northern Italy, witnessed a bloody battle in the Italian War for Independence. And what struck Dunant was that nearly 40,000 people, killed or wounded, were virtually left alone on the battlefield. Nobody was caring for them. So Dunant immediately began organizing the locals to help all the victims, no matter which side of the conflict they were on. The project overwhelmed him. He eventually abandoned his business. He fell into bankruptcy. It took a toll on him. Later, in 1901, Dunant was awarded the very first Nobel Peace Prize. Recognition for his labors of love when he saw what was needed, and he turned and became the answer to that need with the help of others. Love embodied. Love as hard work. Not head in the clouds love, but messy, rough, challenging love. World changing love. That's where the transfiguration takes us if we follow along. I want to share one more thing here this morning. And again, there were rich resources on the Salt Project. It's a wonderful place to go and explore the passages and our faith and artistic expression. One of the pieces they posted this week in thinking about where we are and what's happening was a piece by Toni Morrison, and it's from Paradise, and it's formatted as a poem. And I thought it did a wonderful job of expressing how love is not simple and it's not easy, how it's something we have to work at and learn, and then we can achieve it. So Toni Morrison wrote, Love is divine only and difficult always. If you think it is easy, you are a fool. If you think it is natural, you're blind. It is a learned application without reason or motive, except that it is God. You do not deserve love regardless of the suffering you have endured. You do not deserve love because somebody did you wrong. You do not deserve love just because you want it. You can only earn by practice and careful contemplations the right to express it. And you have to learn how to accept it. Which is to say, you have to earn God. You have to practice God. You have to think God carefully. And if you are a good and diligent student, you may secure the right to show love. Love is not a gift. It is a diploma. The wonderful message 
a message about loving and choosing to do it when it's difficult, when it's hard, when you're not just floating along in a moment of light and bright, but when you're here in the real world and you choose to learn and to share and to be loved to the best you are able. One of the best goals that we can have. Amen. We are grateful for the offerings that folks give to support the church, and it it does feel odd not passing the plate doing those things here, although uh, that's changed in a lot of churches even before this pandemic. People had kiosks set up in churches so that things could happen electronically like we're used to more often. We do have that ability on our website, but we always, of course, accept checks as well, and we accept volunteerism above all else. Uh, We love when folks step forward and are willing to help. We need folks to help out with our stewardship drive, to follow our leader, Patty, and help out. We have other boards, outreach included, uh, that could really use some assistance. So if that's something that might be of interest to you, I'd be happy to connect you with folks and learn more about those opportunities. As we think about our gifts, one of the gifts that we can share is the gift of prayer, and to hold others in our thoughts, our prayers, to lift them up, to ask for God's help, but also to seek ways that we can be the answer to people's prayers. Some of the prayers, and I know these are only some that I'm aware of, I will share with you. One is we had prayed this past week for Roger, who was uh, going to go into the hospital, have a procedure to deal with blockages in the arteries, went in, was able to find that these would be treatable uh, by medicine, which is a wonderful uh, finding, and so we give thanks for that even as he proceeds to get the help he needs. We are going to pray for Heather, who's having surgery on her broken wrist on Tuesday. We're going to pray for Jack, who's having surgery on Monday. Bud, who's having surgery on February 25th, we'll pray for them and for many more who are seeking actively the help of folks who've been gifted through hard work with the ability to turn around and to heal and to help, and we give thanks for that. Finally, we received word this past week that Barbara Drew, one of the members here at West Avon who has, over the past years, lived mostly in Florida, uh, that she passed away on Super Bowl Sunday, actually, but she was able to be surrounded by her family, and it's a gift that they really are thankful for. Um, We want to go ahead and hold her spouse, John, and her entire family and friends in our thoughts as they celebrate her life and all that she did, including having had such a severe stroke uh, back uh, several years back and continuing to move forward in life, using all of her abilities to be able to love and to share the time that she had with others. Uh, So we give thanks for Barbara Drew's life. I want to ask that you would join your heart with mine in prayer, and of course, as always, Please feel free to lift up any prayers that you would like to God, something you can do at any moment in your living. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks on Valentine's Day and on Transfiguration Sunday for your love, for being able to help us to experience that in different ways in our life because it is life-changing. But even more than that, for your love that you offer to us because we marvel at it, it is more than anything else we will ever experience in our life. It is grace. It is offered as a gift. It is offered to us when we make it difficult to love us, and yet you still do. So God, thank you for that model, for helping us to see what love can be. And we ask that you'd help us to in turn share that with others. Today we've lifted up the name of those, names of those who are seeking your help, whether it's in a time where they seek continued healing or procedures and surgeries that are coming up or find themselves in times of grieving and loss. There are so many, God, and many, many more that we're aware of. We ask, God, that you would be with them, that you would help to answer the prayers that are being lifted and to find through your wisdom what gifts to share in their lives. Even more, God, we ask if there are ways that we can be the answers to others' prayers, whether we know it or not, use us. Help us to be your hands and your voice in this world. We ask for that gift even as we celebrate all the good gifts you have shared with us first. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I'd invite us to enjoy our third hymn, Your Love, O God.
I want to thank you for joining us for worship. Uh, we will have our Zoom coffee hour after worship, so we always invite folks to come in there and visit with each other if you have time to do that. We've seen at least one person that's heading out on the waves in Florida, so they won't be able to join us, but it sounds like fun. Uh, I hope that you do have something today to bring joy to your heart. Uh, maybe if Mary decides to give away a PS5, it will bring even more joy to people's hearts. She says no, just, 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 just checked, so that's not happening. Um, but I do hope that there's some way today you can think about the love you've shared or the love you've experienced and the difference it's made in your life and to celebrate that. I want to ask that we would take a moment to ask God's blessing as we end this time of worship. God, thank you for being with us today and every day. We ask that you'd help us to understand that in our lives, because of your love for us, we are never alone, that you're with us every moment, you celebrate with us, you cry with us, you give us wisdom when we need it in the moments where we are stretched so thin, you offer strength that makes the impossible suddenly possible, and you surround us with people who have changed our lives, who are gifts to us beyond every value, and who have transformed our lives, and we give thanks for them. As we end this time of worship, God, our hearts are overflowing as we think about your blessings. We ask, God, that you'd help us then to turn around and to share, to offer love, to share your good news, to help others to understand how deeply cared for they are, how much they matter, who they are to you and who they are to us. Help us, God, to express this in any way possible. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who has gathered us and now sends us forth in ministry. Amen.